and then joined a troupe before setting out on his own. Dr. Cherry has performed original shows with puppets in museums, libraries, and cultural centers for adults and children across the United States. Performances include Can You Spell Harlem, The Land of Primary Colors, and Underground Railroad, Not a Subway. In 2017, Dr. Schroeder's, uh, Dr. Sherry's uh, puppets, um, I lost my way, his puppet Tevin performed at the Smithsonian Institute's National Air and Space Museum, honoring Tuskegee Airmen. Dr. Cherry has a BFA in Fine Arts from the University of Michigan and a PhD in Museum Education from Columbia University. He performs with puppets he has made, as well as authentic West African puppets brought back from his travels to Mali, Senegal, Ghana, and the Ivory Coast. Well, All right, at the very end of the table, we have Jonathan and Frederick Waltz. The Columbia Museum, Alma Thomas, the marionette show as a correlating activity in the public schools. Uh, Mr. Waltz is an expert on American modernism and director of the cultural affairs and curator of, the, of American art at the Columbus Museum, Georgia. His research and writing often incorporate concepts from performance theory. With Seth Feeman, Feeman at the Chrysler Museum of Art in Norfolk, Virginia, he currently um, he is currently co-creating, co-curating. Alma W. Thomas, A Creative Life. Mm -hmm. The exhibition and catalog will both feature a section devoted to Thomas's lifelong involvement with theater and performance. The project opens at the Chrysler Museum in 2021 <coughs> and will travel to other venues before closing at the Columbus Museum in summer 2022. If you haven't got your travel plans together, you've got plenty of time to get down to Georgia. Yeah. Um, thank you and welcome. Um, and just a little bit down the, down the table, we have Professor, Professor Lisa Sanchez Gonzalez. There's a number of um, words in here that look really Spanish, and I will do my best. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Professor Sanchez, Professor of English at the University of Connecticut. Uh, my colleague studied classics and comparative literature at UCLA, where she took her PhD in 1995. She has taught at universities in the United States, Puerto Rico, and Brazil. Her essays have appeared in many scholarly journals and anthologies, including American Literary History, Cultural Studies, here we go, Technofutoros, Critical in Interventions in Latina, Latino um, Studies, and African Roots American Cultures. She has over a decade of production credits in news and public affairs for a wide range of community-based radio stations in the United States, as well as, a documentary, as documentary films. In 2000, she was honored with an international appointment as a Fulbright Scholar in American Studies, <laughs> along with various essays on Puerto Rican, American, and Caribbean liter literary history. Professor Sanchez is the author of Boricua, Boricua Literature, a Literary History of Puerto Rican, uh, diaspora, the Puerto Rican Diaspora, in White Press. In her second book, The Stories I Read to the Children, recovers and explores the life and writing of Sora Belfry. Uh, an early 20th century American folklorist, children's author, librarian, and public intellectual through Centro Press. Her first collection of short stories, Puerto Rican Folk Tales, Cuentos Folkloricos Puerto Ricanos, is a bilingual book, um, and she has also completed a fantasy novel, The Voyage of the Kunjari. Her current scholarly project includes tribal futurism, the post apocalypse, exploring and recreating the future. Thank you and welcome. I hope you have a drive to fall out. So in the order of the, of, of the introductions, we will let you all have a conversation about your abstract and the things that you'd like to talk about are important and a little bit about uh, your presentations. And then uh, after we finish that, we'll open up and have a conversation. Does that sound all right? Yes. Okay. There's no roadmap for this. All right. Please. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Yolanda Sampson, and I have one question. What time is it? <laughs> it's time for puppetainment. Look at your neighbor and say, it's time for puppetainment. It's time for puppetainment. Look at your other neighbor and say, it's time for puppetainment. It's time for puppetainment. All right, now, give your a
to first of all thank uh, Dr. John Bell and Dr. Paul Richards and Caleb Martinez and Elton Blicks and, and to our distinguished panel on today uh, just for the opportunity to be here and just to share a little bit about uh, my story, puppetry and community, power puppets and portable pulpits, a uh, personal account of puppet ministry in the African American community. Now, don't you know that puppets have power? <laughs> Come on. You think that the President of the United States, those that are in Congress, those that are in the Senate, those that are our bosses in the workplaces have power? You better think again. Because puppets have power. <laughs> Puppetainment, as I coined it, is a fresh blend of puppets and entertainment. It is a powerful, effective, and creative way to educate, empower, enlighten, and communicate with audiences of all ages. Now you know it's audiences of all ages. Many of us in this room, we're puppeteers. We perform to the children. And we know that adults love puppets. Look at this whole room. <laughs> it's an ancient craft that never grows old. Puppets have power to transform individuals, communities, and the world in which we live. Yes. Puppets, we use to communicate all kinds of messages. And for me, as an ordained Baptist minister, <laughs> we do puppet ministry. And in puppet ministry is using puppets to teach the timeless, virtues of Jesus Christ in a hip and an entertaining way while bringing the biblical principles of life. It was long ago that I, I started off puppet ministry uh, at the age of 12. My former youth pastor, uh, Reverend Alice Mozan, described me as a shy child. Sometimes, you know, at that age of 12, I grew up in a household with three brothers. And they didn't want to play with me. And so often, you know, I would go to the dolls, I would go to the puppets, and I would have to play by myself because they didn't want to play with me. <laughs> so I was a little bit introverted. And so when Reverend Mozan came to Tacoma Park Baptist Church, and he introduced the, the beautiful work and the majesty of puppetry, I was like, oh, yes, I can come to life. I can, I can be somebody here. And it, it was just a powerful way just to learn about Jesus Christ. And I was just so excited about it. Now, puppet, there's a difference between a puppet show, a regular puppet show, and puppet ministry. We, we, we can have something like, you know, the Muppets or, or, or Sesame Street that talk about, you know, values, you know, how to count or being a good friend. But when we're dealing with puppet ministry, I'm doing it from the basis of the Bible, what Jesus has taught in the Bible. And so in puppet ministry, I'm not afraid to say the word Jesus. I'm not afraid to say that you refer to scripture that are in the Bible to teach about forgiveness, Mark 11 and 25. If you have it, hold anything against anybody, forgive them so that your heavenly father can forgive you for your sins. So we can be blatant about that. And so we're promoting the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, what is a portable pulpit? Now, on Sunday morning, sometimes I'm preaching from that pulpit. But the pulpit that I prefer is the puppet stage. <laughs> and so a portable pulpit is simply a puppet stage. A puppet stage that can go anywhere. Preach behind there. Or preach outside on the street. Here we go. You can preach in the church. You can preach in the nursing home with the puppets. You can preach in the hospital. Give a message. You can preach at uh, community block parties at various schools. And you can take mission trips all around the world. It's exciting doing puppet ministry and talking about Jesus with puppets. And people get excited. Lively characters dealing with these situations that we deal with from day to day. It was after I graduated from Howard University School of Communications. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was studying. I had all these internships 
um, that had to do with television broadcasts. Yeah, I had an internship at Channel 9, Channel 20. I, I had an um, internship at WHUR. I had an internship at Black Entertainment Television. I just knew that I was going into television news. But by the time I was a senior, I decided, oh no, this is not what I want to do. And so it was in that transition time after graduating, I was like, okay, Lord, you know, what is it that you want me to do with the life that you've given me? And so um, it was on a particular Sunday, I was doing a little puppet skit about self-esteem. And I invited my friend Eleanor and her mother to, to see the puppet show. And so after the puppet show and after church service, they're like, she was like, wow, your mother, this is wonderful. Can you come to my school and do this? I said, sure. I'm going to come on. I'm going to go to your school, and we're going to do this. And so after the show, uh, it, it had such an overwhelming response from, from the students in Southeast Washington, D.C. And it was in an area that was plagued by drugs. It was in that year of 1992 that D.C. was labeled the murder capital of the world with 451 homicides that particular year. It was in that same year that I had a friend of mine, she had a, her boyfriend was a drug dealer. And she, they were driving down the street in his car, and there was a hit out for him. He ducked in the car, but there were 14 bullets that went through her body. Oh. And so it was, a, it, was, it was an urgency that I had that I, I, I've got to do something. I've got to get this message across. And so it was at that school, Highland, Randall, Randall Highlands Elementary School in Southeast Washington, D.C., that I gave the self-esteem anti-drug message. And so, at the end of the show, uh, my friend's mother paid me. She gave me a checky check. <laughs> and I found out that I was in business. <laughs> she started referring me to other schools and other churches. And uh, my parents brought me my first business cards and gave me the money to help buy sound equipment. Uh, come on, Puppet Tainment was ready to go. <laughs> Here in this, um, this is one of my very first sets, a graffiti wall. I did a lot of work in the inner city, and that was Lavero, um, one of the very first Lavero. She had red hair. She didn't have her afro back then. <laughs> and so uh, she would go around to different schools, and actually that was at uh, Arlington uh, Theater in uh, Arlington, Virginia, uh, where that particular show was. Um, the opportunities have really um, opened up at this time. And it was here that I really understood that this, this is my passion. This is, this is, this is why I live. I, I live to be a puppeteer. I live to give the messages of hope. Because it was such a good feeling to be able to, to do my craft and to learn and to grow into that and to help other people be excited about it too while getting a wonderful message and a paycheck in the hand. <laughs> Now, I, I will mention it to you that, um, that, uh, that's my first business card right there. Um, at that particular time, I did an um, arts festival. And that's, that was the current mayor at the time, current uh, Sharon Pratt Kelly. And kids just made little stick bubbles and they made the little stages out of cardboards. And they were just so excited about it. And I was excited about it too. But as you know, you know, puppetry can be a very expensive craft. I didn't know how to do it out of the, you know, the household, household items. And I began to feel a little bit discouraged. Um, I had some friends of mine uh, that are now doctors and lawyers. <laughs> Fortune 500 <laughs> owners. And, you know, they're like, you know, Yolanda, when are you going to get a real job, girlfriend? When are you going to put those puppets down? You play with them? a little bit too much. You need to get a real job. <laughs> and so, you know, you know that, that, that kind of, you know, played in my mind because at that time there weren't that many African-American puppeteers, especially female. We knew about uh, Sherry, you know, at the time, um, but there were very few. We knew about IU Pass, but there were very few at the time. And so we thought that, you know, maybe we need to do something, you know, a little different and something that was res would be respected in the community. And so, did that, and then um, I got a call from uh, that big stage oh, in, in London, um, 
it got lost. <laughs> I couldn't get it on the plane. It was too heavy. It was too bulky. So when I was traveling back from London, they were like, uh, uh, Yolanda, you either need to make the play, it's going to be you or the stage. So the stage got left there. And so that's one of the reasons why we turned to the portable puppet set. And uh, we've done pageants before, and uh, one of our fellow competitors shared with us, they were like, Yolanda, they need to see your face. And so um, we designed this along with uh, Carmen Henry and did a little skit called Everything Must Change. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a result, yes, that helped us with this Black Girl 1995. You can follow your and $10,000 and you know, opportunity to go to different parts of the world. It opened up the door not only uh, to, to talk to children about self-esteem day in school and things like that, it was a chance for me to bring my puppets. <laughs> and I brought those puppets everywhere that I could. It opened up opportunities that I would not believe. I uh, was in Senegal for the African African American Summit, you know, speaking there. And it, it was there at that particular summit. Uh, with leaders that I met one of the heads at Anheuser Bush, and that opened up the opportunity for me to do the great Kings and Queens storytelling puppet show at the major black conventions all across the United States of America. And so not only were people getting this black world, they were able to get a puppet show as well. And so schools, libraries, positive difference, and, and carrying those puppet stage became very heavy and and so um, we decided to go digital with the What Time Is It video series. And it was a, it's not in existence anymore, blockbuster stores, video stores. <laughs> and uh, Billboard magazine said it was endlessly creative. And then we had our premiere of the next video, Tell It Like It Is, at the Smithsonian's Museum of American History. And there you have, you know, Papa Dina's puppets. And, and we had the, the different pumps, the Supreme Word of God, regular comfort, and premium prayer. Come on, we got to bring home the message. And so through that journey, the Lord opened up and said, you know, Yolanda, I really want you to just focus in on puppet ministry. And so we gave you go, yo, worldwide. Go yielding in obedience to God. There are so many things. Puppets are not only therapeutic for the children, but those that write the stories. I went through a situation, I got in a bad business decision, and I was stuck with uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars of debt that I did not make. And so I had to go through the process of learning how to forgive. We had to turn the pain into power. And that pain <coughs> turned into puppet power! <laughs> you know, to share with others and teaching forgiveness and, um, you know, to different parts of the country. Puppetry is able to reach a marginalized populations or lower, lower socioeconomic population in ways that other interventions cannot. Um, year before last, went up to the Standing Rock Indian Reservation in North Dakota. That's where they were building the pipeline. It's there in that reservation that many are alcoholics. They're facing a lack of jobs. The only place where they can get a job on the reservation is the casino. And so a lot of the children were experiencing um, abuse, sexual abuse. Um, by family members and friends. And so I um, went up there in, in conjunction with uh, the Waukee uh, Church up there and was able to teach a forgiveness workshop. And the kids make puppets and were able to do their little skits about forgiveness. And so it helped them to process what they were going through. Went down to Panama and uh, talked to the children there in Colón, Panama, one of the poorest cities in the country. I mean, in some places they don't even have running water in, you know, 2016-17. And so there's a lot of power that we can have in using the gift of puppetry. Maybe you're not doing puppet ministry, but you have a message. Maybe you don't have a message, but you can teach a child puppetry to help them to know that their, their characters, their creativity can help them to process what they're going through and can provide joy and happiness, you know, for them. Martin Luther King Jr. said, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about the things that matter. There are a lot of things in this community that matter, and we can use those puppets to change the world. Be the change that you want to be. And let's teach our children and others how to change our situations, how to change our communities, and how to change our world. There is, I conclude, 
power puppets and portable pulpits. Dropped my bags in a hotel, hopped a 
you hopped anything that had wheels on it and went out to the villages and started exploring around. And I met people, I told them what I was looking for. Um, as you know, Senegal is a Francophone country, so I had to say, I'm looking for I'm looking for a I'm looking for a puppet. And he looked at me like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and this, this American, and, and in their context, I'm a white American. This white American man is looking for a puppet. Right. Go get your dolls. He's going to pay us money. <laughs> and that's how I came across things like this. This is a ram's head. It's made out of wood with cowrie shells to imitate the wool and the, the fabric uh, for the body. I also learned about how Africans were doing their puppetry. And as I mentioned outside, sometimes these puppets are on top of the puppeteer. So the puppeteer is actually clothed in, in fabric and the puppet is, is on the very top. Um, I would manage to find this puppet. This is um, a female puppet from Mali. And I used her in a show, actually. She's the color wizard in a show called Land of Primary Color. That's a land where everything is a primary color, red, yellow, or blue. Until one day, the boy who delivers the color pots breaks the pots because he's juggling them, and the colors mix up. So you've got these secondary colors. Don't know what's going to happen with these secondary colors. The only person who can put you out of that dilemma is color wizard. She does on Blue Mountain. This is, this is the one who, who plays color wizard. Now, I have to say, the color wizard outside was the initial color wizard. I learned very quickly that girl is heavy. <laughs> she is solid wood. Um, so her understudy became the key player. This, this is the <laughs> Gazelle is another puppet from West Africa. Um, in this in this example, there is a figure on top, and those the hands go up and down, and it's pounding on wood. So in the story of Land of Primary Color, I've I've attached a piece of fabric to that neck piece, and there's a rod that kind of flips the fabric like this. Because in the storyline, Gazelle is the character who runs so fast you never see her legs move. Mm -hmm. So in the performance, she comes out from behind the stage and she dances out in the audience. I, I think I'm one of the very few African-American, I think I'm one of the few puppeteers in America that actually use authentic puppets in their, in their presentation. So that was a niche that I was trying to find. This is a picture of a show that um, is in Bubu, um, the southern part of Mali. Uh, another part of Ivory Coast. These people are, are, are river people, and this is an example of a puppet that would have been performed in a canoe. So if you see the raffia, where the raffia is, that's where the puppeteers would be seated, yeah. and the puppets actually would be in the back, would appear in the back of the puppet. Mm -hmm. This is, the canoes would be in, in the river, and folks would, am I, am I talking? And the folks would be on the bank, the folks would be at the bank watching the performance from the river. Um, in New York, I worked at the Studio Museum in Harlem in education. Again, I wanted to work with puppets, so I introduced puppets in that, in that museum. We would um, develop storylines that, that were related to the exhibitions at the time. This is a puppet that I developed. It's African-inspired. It's made out of plastic wood, still toxic material, so using that. And, and a raffia, um, and I threw a piece of plastic cloth over him. But he's operated, the rod is the central body, and then there are two rods, one on each wing. So when he flies out into the audience, he actually flies above the audience. <coughs> this is Africa Brown, rod puppet, eyes and mouth open and closed, hands operated, much like Miss Lily is operated. Uh, Mayor Koch, uh, Mayor of New York at that time, was kind of intrigued by what was going on. <laughs> he ne and he never misses a photo op, so he got to meet, he got to meet the preacher and um, Miss Carey. Um, I moved to another museum in Baltimore, and I was a director of education there. I decided I wanted to allow adults to play in the galleries. I, I thought at the time that our programs were just way too serious and adults were not able to have fun. So a buddy of mine who was a psychiatrist and was a girlfriend, we just started talking about, well, it would be great to have a character who was be Miss Lily, and she's got a line of cookies, and she has an, indeter an indeterminate number of husbands, she's divorced, but she's independently wealthy, and she's all of this, and she's a docent. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how we introduced Miss Lily. Miss Lily became yeah. the docent for the galleries, and we introduced her as only for adults. This was not a kid's program. Because Miss Lily's character, Miss Lily does not do well with children. <laughs> <laughs> that's part of her makeup. So we're, we're, very, we're very clear about that. I don't know how many of you have experienced the fact that no matter when you tell, no matter how many, you, how many times you tell somebody the puppet show is for adults, they bring their genius five-year-old. <laughs> Well, 
And she addressed the parent and said, dear, this is an adult affair. There's a workshop in the next room. <laughs> That's who she was. Um, Mr. Zeke is a narrator for a show called Underground Railroad, not a subway. I was working with some high school students in New York, and I said, oh, you guys know about the Underground Railroad? The Underground Railroad, right? He said, yeah, man, everybody knows that. That was a subway to help black people get the free. <laughs> starts talking about winning and losing, sometimes you um, getting and losing. Sometimes the thing that you're losing is getting something else. And in this case, the runaway slave or the enslaved person who ran away is getting something else. The slave owner was losing his slave. Mm -hmm. um, as part of the story, I'm using different types of puppets. I'm using rod puppets, I'm using hand puppets, and I'm also using wood cutouts. So this is a scene of the cabin where the boy, Kyle, is instructed to go to the farmhouse because there are some people there who will help him get to the next station. So there's a lot of exchange back and forth with types of puppetry. Sometimes the environments I'm working in are historic houses. Wow. And I have to say one of the most moving times I had was actually at a historic house that was owned by free enslaved blacks. Wow. Um, it, I just had chills. Because the set is outside of this cabin. The cabin is too small to perform inside, so all the performances are outdoors. So the stage is set up right outside the cabin and the puppets are standing are like in front of us authentic place. This is what the audience looks like from the outside. And I thought, this is getting back to African traditions. We are outdoors again. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, unlike Afri African traditions, these people are sitting in seats. Right. With African puppets and puppetry, uh, people are standing, they're moving around, there's a lot of movement, but they're, not, they're generally not sitting down in chairs. So that's a, that's a Western uh, influence. This is a scene of Zeke, the narrator, talking to the free black lady. Uh, she's the <coughs> one who actually tells Kyle to leave the plantation and go to the next house. This is the only puppet I did not make. This is made by a doll maker, a friend of mine, Andrea Lewis. I wanted for that character to have a different type of look. Mm -hmm. She doesn't make puppets, she makes dolls. Mm -hmm. I always take her dolls and make them into puppets. <laughs> so we have that kind of dynamic. That's not a puppet, it's a doll. It's a puppet now. <laughs> <laughs> That's a puppet now. Another show is, uh, can you spell Harlem? This is a, sh a shot of Gabriel, real, who in this role, I, I audition my puppets for roles, because I have this family of puppets, and when I have a, 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 narr um, a narrative, I look at the puppets and see who can play what role. So Gabriel plays the daddy role, he's a DJ, he's got a radio program, and he's got a call-in show, Who Knows About Harlem. His son is one, wants to be a rapper, gets caught in school rapping, doesn't know what he's really talking about, he talks about, yeah, there are a lot of black people who make art and make music a long time ago, but so he just says, well, who are they? doesn't know. <laughs> he goes home, dad has got this call, call and radio show. People are calling in and giving information about saying James Band disease or Noah Hurston, um, just a bunch of artists. And so by the end of the show, he knows about these people and he puts together a rap. Harlem is a place in New York City to get artists there and make things are pretty. Maybe he pictures some words and colors and sound. Renaissance was the best thing around. So he kind of goes with that chant. And by the end of the story, there's been so much repetition that the audience knows these names and what they were connected with in terms of creating art. Um, recently, we had the opportunity to work with the National Air and Space Museum. They were honoring Tuskegee Airmen, the black pilots from Tuskegee. So the puppet that works with this is Tevin. Now, Tevin's character is actually, he's a black Brit. But for this role, he had to drop that accent, like he just elbow drops his accent. Um, he doesn't have the black accent because I, did, I just did not think that he could do that and just pull it off without being dodgy. So he doesn't have an accent. But when he's doing the show, we're we're dealing with kids who may or may not speak English, who may or may not have English as a first or second language. You don't know in the museum setting who's going to show up until they show up. And I was trying to get a, a um, I was trying to get a, a character take of who the audience was going to be, and they said, just be prepared for anything. So in this show, Tevin shows up with a sack full of stuff. It's in a big candy cloth bag, and he talks to the audience and says, I've got a bag full of stuff that's lies. And the kids are looking at stuff, and he, says, and he pulls out a gorilla and says, a gorilla can fly. <laughs> no, a gorilla can't fly. Okay, okay, okay. Um, a book can fly. No, a book can't fly. Eventually, he pulls out something that, I could, that can actually fly, like a bird. Let me talk about wings. Now, we're inside the National Air and Space Museum, so sur we're surrounded by actual planes. And we make the connection between 
wings, flying, um, navigation, all of that. We, 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 we talked about the planes, and then they go on a scavenger hunt without, throughout the galleries looking for particular things that were connected with the Tuskegee Airmen. So that's a part of how that, that program came about. In Baltimore, we have a really great puppet community. We do puppet slams, and I have an opportunity to play with other puppets. This is a shot of Dirk Joseph and his daughter Azaria. Um, you can see it. this is an example of their cardboard puppets. I think this, and they are really surrealist in their story. This is a story about a, a, a boy and his sister, and they're bored one day, and they go into this imaginary land. I'm not going to give you too much because they're actually performing this week. This is another example of a couple in Baltimore, and they're an example of great engineering, good homesteads. They have, um, he is actually a great engineer in terms of carving and putting things together that, that work like machines. He does that really well. Garoji is another puppeteer in our area. He does puppets that interact with the audience. He's an educator, so he does a lot of education types of things with young kids. This is one of my puppets. This is Maya Opinion. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say about her. You met Ms. Lily, and in this puppet's land piece, she's actually singing about a chair. You might be familiar with that song, If I Can't Sell It, I'll Sit Down Upon It. The storyline is about a woman who owns a second-hand shop. She has a chair. There's a guy who comes in, and, and he thinks the chair is too much, so she calls him cheap. And she says, honey, if you can't buy it, I will just sit down upon it. It's one of those risky, bluesy songs. So this is a, you met recently outside, this is a chance for her to play. <laughs> As a puppet docent, she had a chance to work with the National African American Museum of History and Culture in Smithsonian. And here we were highlighting what the museum called from ordinary to extraordinary. And they were highlighting six recent acquisitions. One of the ex one of the acquisitions was a shawl. The ordinary piece of it was that it was a shawl. The extraordinary piece of it was this shawl belonged to Harriet Tubman. It was given to Harriet Tubman by Queen Victoria. Miss mm -hmm. Lily relates all of that information in the tour. Another thing that she highlighted in that tour was Nate, um, Nate's Bible. From I'm drawing a blank. Nate. <laughs> Nat Turner. Yeah, thank you. Nat Turner. Nat Turner. This is actually his Bible. So she's able to talk to them about um, the context of that Bible and how important it is and the fact that it's so fragile that they have to, they have to keep it enclosed in an enclosed case. I'm currently working on a story of children in the civil rights movement. Um, this... In this scenario, the puppet DeAndre is the narrator, and he's also manipulating the other puppets. This is a, a time when, in the civil rights movement in, Al in Alabama, they had in jail, they had jailed most of the adults. And some guy came to church and said, we need to fill up the jail with the children. <coughs> Not everybody bought into that concept, but eventually they decided, we're going to let the children march. So that became a big event. There, the word spread around. A DJ, a very popular DJ, said children is going to be a party in the park. Showed up in the park at 12 noon. Kids were like jumping out of the windows out of schools. They were marching down in front of the church. And they were met by the police on the first day. On the first day, they were just met by the police and carted off. The second day, they were met by police and water hoses. And the kids were just blown away with the water hoses and with dogs. The dogs actually attacked the kids and the other marchers. So this is a, um, a shot showing all the kids of uh, the multiple scenes after the kids are marching on the third day, the fire hoses are there, the cops are there with the kids, and DeAndre is actually manipulating the, the puppet pieces as he tells that story. This is a story that you, we're actually performing this weekend. Uh, it's called The Land of Dark, How the Sun Came to the Sky. I have to say, when we're, we're, talking, we're identifying ourselves as African American puppeteers, I never really say this is a black puppet. They are what they are. Um, so DeAndre, again, is, is, he auditioned for this job, so he's got it. He's manipulating the puppets. It takes place in a land where everything is dark, but it's a really beautiful place. All the colors are dark, dark blues, dark greens, dark purples, even yellows are dark. And everybody has their own star. One by one, people start losing their stars until there's only one star left in the land that belongs to Aisha. And Aisha does not want to share her star with anybody. They encourage her to do the star throw because they throw the star up in the sky. I'm not going to say anything in this room. You have to come yeah, yeah. But that's how he does it. And that's what we're working on right now. For those of you who read the New York Times or who follow
followed news about the Obama White House, you may be wondering why the organizers of this conference invited an art historian to speak about Emma W. Thomas. The wider world knows her primarily as a visual artist who, despite race, gender, and age, produced a coherent body of brightly colored, nature-based abstractions that made her world famous in the 1970s. After her death in 1978, Thomas's reputation declined, but it's recently flourished again in about the past five years or so, and acrylic paintings of this particular size, six feet tall, um, are currently selling for about a million dollars. But this is a puppetry symposium. <coughs> For those of you unfamiliar with the artist, here's just a brief biography. At the end of the 19th century, Ama Thomas was born in Columbus, Georgia, a city on the Chattahoochee River, and it's approximately 100 miles southwest of Atlanta. She moved as a teenager with her family to Washington, D.C. in order to seek better economic and educational opportunities. In 1924, Thomas became the first person ever to receive a fine arts degree from Howard University. She eventually taught in the District of Columbia school system until 1960. While she had been painting seriously since at least her undergraduate days in the 1920s, her retirement allowed her to turn her attention to working in the studio full time. In 1972, she became the first African-American woman to be granted a solo exhibition at the Whitney Museum of American Art. Wow. Her many art historical milestones are also no noteworthy in terms of the interwoven histories of achievement by women and African-Americans in the United States. The United States Postal System included one of Thomas's images on its 2005 paint of stamps entitled To Form a More Perfect mm -hmm. Union. It's circled there in orange. But Thomas was much more than just her multi-hued canvases from the 1960s and 70s. Though she declined to describe herself as an intellectual, Thomas maintained a lifelong and capacious curiosity about human cultures and the natural world. She therefore explored in depth and over time many aspects of the arts, humanities, and sciences including history and art history, literature, gardening, architecture, astronomy, activism, and probably most relevant for this audience, the performing arts. One of the goals of the research on, the, on Thomas that I have undertaken with my co-curator, Seth Heeman, is we're both trying to understand how the artist's creativity wove together all of these interdisciplinary interests and how they form found form in her finished paintings. Thomas enjoyed a lifelong passion for the stage. Indeed, she was recruited in the Howard University's Department of Art by Professor James Herring, based on the strength of some co uh, uh, costume designs that he saw that she had made, um, and she was working um, with the extracurricular theater troupe in the production of those. And you can see uh, one of the photos where those costumes have been realized. Following previous performance theorists such as Irving Goffman, Victor Turner, and Richard Schechner, I'm not only interested in Thomas's involvement with the performing arts per se, but also interested in how she performed various aspects of her persona, from elegant self-fashioning, and believe me, she dressed really nicely, <laughs> and um, she was also very um, interested in how she appeared uh, in the media, which and she sort of created many opportunities for that to happen throughout her life. Um, in addition to teaching a holistic classroom cu curriculum focused on student-centered theatrical productions. So because of time constraints, um, I can only mention in passing here other performance-related works, um, such as Watusi, <coughs> a painting on the left, um, of course named after the 1960s dance, and then um, this really exuberant portrait of Pearl Bailey in the title role of an all-black production of Hello, Dolly. Um, can't spend time on those so that I can talk more about um, 
the marionettes that she was involved with during the 1930s. Much of what we know about Emma Thomas and her involvement with marionettes stems from the fact that she was an ambitious junior high school teacher, by which I mean, in pursuit of greater status and better pay, Thomas, who had been hired with a Bachelor of Science degree in Fine Arts and a teaching certificate, began and completed a master's degree in art education while teaching full time. Inferring from extant documents, Thomas undertook these graduate studies in order to receive higher compensation. As part of her petition to school administrators, she compiled a portfolio that documented the professional development activities that justified her request for salary augmentation. Somehow, in the dispersal of the artist's estate, these records were separated and deposited at two different institutions, the Smithsonian's Archives of American Art, which is headquartered in Washington, D.C., and they hold the majority of the folders that were part of this portfolio, and the Columbus Museum in Georgia, where I work, and we have four of the folders, and at the top you can see just sort of a sampling of materials that's found inside. The bottom slide is, um, uh, just sort of a screen grab from the Archives of American Art. I'm really thrilled to say that the um, exhibition project that I've been working on, um, we identified funding to be able to uh, digitize all of the materials that the Archives of American Art has on Alan Thomas, so that is now available and online, um, which is a great outcome. Mostly unpublished, this subset of Thomas's archives, so I'm speak, speaking specifically of this group of folders that she used to justify her um, salary augmentation, it's a treasure trove of information. For example, it verifies her association with modernist puppeteer Tony Sarg. There's the portrait of his summer course that she took in 1935. And, um, her collaboration with the Washington DC <coughs> branch of the Federal Theater Project, which was an initiative of the Works Progress Administration. And it's hard to see, but basically this is uh, sort of a press release and about this festival that she um, basically organized and engineered and it's uh, in association with the Federal Theater Project. Only five marionettes from Alma Thomas productions are known to currently exist, um, if you know of any more, I'd love to know about them. Um, from a production in Alice in Wonderland, there um, is uh, Tweedledee or Tweedledum, we're not sure which one, um, and the Mad Hatter, um, you can see those there on the screen. Um, possibly from the, uh, the play called The Three Wishes, um, which was uh, written by Tony Sark, but um, that Alan Thomas produced several times. Um, the two main characters, Martin and Margaret, you can see those on the right, top and bottom. And the standalone clown who performed sort of one-off songs or monologues, sort of like between acts or after, after the production was, the pr production proper was over. Um, I took some uh, quick s snapshots in the vault um, earlier this week so I could show you kind of how they were made. Um, the Alice in Wonderland puppets, are each about 12 inches in height, so they're smaller than the other three, and man, these things are built like tanks, I'm really serious. <laughs> they are heavy, they have lead weights in the feet and limbs and torso, and kind of there on the uh, foot near the bottom of the screen, you can sort of see the lead peeking through because the, the shoe leather has fallen apart. Um, the heads and hands are carved and painted wood, um, both of these puppets sport handmade clothing complete with snap fasteners at various points and she talks about in her written master's thesis about how that facilitated costume changes. Um, and uh, these puppets, um, the Tweedledum and um, Mad Hatter, we don't have the strings any longer, whether they would have been original or restrung at some point, but we don't have the strings at all. As for the other three, um, they're much more finely constructed. I've realized in writing this paper that um, the, the Alice in Wonderland puppets were pre-Tony Sarg, so I think that's a little bit why they're 
somewhat clunkier, but also the students were really involved in producing them themselves, whereas these other three, um, I'm pretty sure she would have made um, that summer working with Sard in New York. Um, and they're, they're really, really um, well made. Um, they're larger in scale, about two feet tall each. Um, they don't have any weights at all in them. The head, torso, and feet are wood, and you can see in this slide um, that the, the head of Margaret actually is hollowed out somewhat. The fingers are wire or um, small cylindrical pieces of wood. I'm not really sure, but you can see how she's used this painted cotton fabric tape to uh, create the hands, which is a real difference with the other marionettes because that was just sort of like a piece of wood with a little bit of articulation. The clothing um, of these three is really finely made. And there's a lot of awesome detailing in the, the costumes. Um, the body articulations, which you can see here in the legs, are really um, sophisticated. Um, there's this kind of wire that holds the, sort of a fabric hinge um, to make the legs move. Um, and these three actually do still have strings. I'm not sure if they're original, but they are still um, strong. Normal wear and tear consonant with use, as well as various printed programs in the archives, um, indicate that these five carionettes started multiple performances during the 1930s. So as a curator, um, I have to say I find it fascinating that none of my colleagues who previously organized large-scale exhibition projects on Thomas have ever consulted the copy of her master's thesis at Columbia University. <laughs> as the title page indicates, it's a written report of the planning process and implementation of a student-led dra dramatic production of Alice in Wonderland using marionettes. The text of the thesis itself is short. It's only about 11 pages of exposition, and it has one, a single page of uh, bibliography. But um, from my perspective as a 21st century reader, um, here are some basic ideas that really jumped out at me. Perhaps not surprisingly, um, and this is because of John Dewey's influence in the curriculum at Columbia, um, perhaps not surprisingly, the text asserts that the impetus for the production came from the students themselves, not from any imposition by a teacher. Two, contemporaneous inspiration arose from, among other sources, the 1932 visit to Washington, D.C. by Alice Little, and this is the girl who Lewis Carroll wrote the original story for, and also a screening of the 1933 musical romance, I Am Suzanne, which involves a heartthrob named Tony, who teaches the titular character, Suzanne, to become a puppeteer. The production um, in the classroom was probably in 1933, or possibly 1934. Um, oh, third, overseen by Thomas, the ninth grade students who participated on this project conducted serious research into topics ranging from color theory previously staged versions of Alice in Wonderland, period furnishings, and lighting design. I mean, like the, the areas of research are just amazing for um, what she kind of pushed my creators to do. Four, distribution of labor uh, for the production fell strictly along gender lines. This sentence from the thesis is typical, quote, the work was divided so that the girls made the drop curtain and the curtain to conceal the manipulation. The boys made the footlight reflector, the scenery, and the framework of the concealing curtain. I'm sure some of this had to do with how um, the different genders were steered towards different courses in the curriculum, um, but it still really kind of jumped out at me at how gendered this uh, document was. The production truly engaged many, if not most, areas of the curriculum. As this page from additional supporting materials reveals, you can see that, um, for example, the writing of the play was handled by the English department, that um, making the bodies of the, of the puppets um, was handled in the art department, costumes in what we would call home economics these days, um, staged by the uh, the wood and metal departments, um, lighting. They had an electric department at the high school or junior high. Um, 
program was uh, made by the printing department and music was handled by the music department. So that's basically um, her big idea and her thesis is that this production would bleed into all of these areas of the school and sort of be focused in this one thing. The last paragraph discusses observed results. Quote, the pupils learn to accept responsibility, to cooperate with the group, to exhibit self-control when they wanted only to play with the puppets and to persist. <laughs> <laughs> and to persist when they were compelled to manipulate the puppets many times before they would work perfectly. They also learned to be courteous, although they were often impatient for the outcome. Perhaps the greatest pupil outcome was the vast pride and achievement and satisfaction which these <coughs> youngsters obtained from their very obvious success. It seems that Thomas's interest in puppeteering waned in the in the 1930s, um, but the marionette-related skills and knowledge she had acquired, as well as the objects themselves, continued to exert an influence on her life and work. Um, this slide is from a talk given by um, uh, a woman named uh, uh, Ida Jervis. Um, that's what's, yeah, so um, Ida Jervis was involved with the founding of the National Cup Capital Puppetry Guild in the 1940s. You can see a little bit there in that uh, paragraph I've highlighted. Um, she was one of the sort of founding members, and she asked Alma Thomas to um, one of the group's meetings in her home in Arlington. Um, and at that meeting, uh, Thomas was asked to join the group. Um, uh, it's really um, compelling to me to see in these notes from Ida Jervis that the reason why Thomas gives that she can't join the group is because she really wants to concentrate at this point on her painting. So there is really this kind of conscious choice to move away from the puppet, puppeteering. Although Thomas declined to join the group, she and Ida Jervis became lifelong friends. And what's also really interesting is that um, Jervis herself moved away from puppets to painting and then moved on to becoming a uh, journal, uh, photojournalist. And um, one of the things that she covered for the DC area was um, doing these profiles on different artists um, who were living and working in the, in the um, District of Columbia. It's a, this amazing resource for folks working on um, those uh, artists from an art historical perspective. But, um, she also documented images of these people who might not have otherwise been depicted. And so probably the most famous um, photographs that we have of Thomas are, are actually by Ida Jervis herself. From my perspective as an art historian, I see formal and conceptual through lines from Thomas's marionette productions in the 30s to her later work as a practicing visual artist, including her choice of subject for the watercolor Macy's Parade 1960, which of course relates to Tony Sarr because he was invited to sort of innovate that, um, the helium balloon specifically for the Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving Parade. Um, her painted sketches of the 1963 March on Washington, I'm just showing one here, but to me that sort of movement of the placards really uh, is really consonant with sort of a rod puppet movement. And um, this virtually unknown mobile from the 1960s and that idea of sort of suspension, but also the engineering that's involved, I think really um, sort of translates from her previous interest in marionettes. Thomas um, goes on the record to say that she loved her paintings and she created, um, she loved the paintings that she created to such an extent that she actually called them her children and she was really reluctant to give them away. Um, the photographic record, such as this image of a corner of her living space by um, African-American photojournalist Roland, Roland Freeman, suggests that Alma Thomas's marionettes occupied a similarly high place in the artist's regard. Um, this is from a photo shoot for Black Enterprise Magazine, where they did, uh, in 1973, they did a whole issue um, dedicated to black artists working at the time and making a living, and um, Alma Thomas was one of them. This wasn't published, um, so 
it was amazing to actually find this, and um, we'll be able to publish it in the catalog for the exhibition. Um, I'd like to end by inviting you all to attend that exhibition, Alma W. Thomas, A Creative Life. I'm uh, co-curating it with Seth Beeman at the Chrysler Museum in Norfolk, Virginia. Um, between summer 2021 and summer 2022, it will appear at four different venues around the country. I hope you'll take advantage of the opportunity to learn more about Alma Woodsy Thomas and her main, many creative outlets, including marionettes. Thanks. American children's librarianship, I was contextualizing her in the history of global folklore traditions, and I did all sorts of literary historical research, but the one thing I didn't do was uh, poetry. And then I thought, what a wonderful opportunity. We are a research university. Perhaps someone in the audience or one of their students might be interested in pursuing this even more. So I brought my cards. <laughs> Extraordinary public intellectual of the Puerto Rican diaspora, Pura Belpre was born in Sidra, Puerto Rico, in 1899, and died in New York City in 1982 after a prolific career as a children's author, librarian, advocate, and puppeteer. Among other firsts, Belpre wrote the first mainstream Latino storybook in U.S. publishing history, entitled Perez and Martina, which was published by Beatrix Potter's publisher, Frederick Warren, in 1932. The American Library Association has named a major children's literature medal in her honor, um, which I'm happy to report now is going to include young adult fiction. Um, and in many ways, I think that Belpre is the Zora Neale Hurston of Afro-Caribbean American literary history of the flamboyant polyglot twist. Um, Belpre's extraordinary career at the New York Public Library began in 1921 during the founding decades of their system-wide children's services. What most people don't know about this period in library history is that those involved in creating the first children's rooms had a radical view of their charge. Serving a multicultural and multilingual population in New York City's ethnic enclave, these pioneer librarians considered it their duty to make the children's rooms equally multicultural and multilingual. They also felt that the best way for children to understand and appreciate the cultures of others meant helping them understand and appreciate their own. And this is why Anne Carol Moore, the superintendent of work with children at the time, based the hiring criteria for assistant librarians in the children's rooms on their creative energy and knowledge of these diverse communities' languages, literatures, and oral storytelling traditions, rather than uh, degrees in librarianship. <laughs> these women, Belpre <coughs> among them, carefully chose and then became loving curators of the book collections they displayed in their reading rooms. Historically, of course, this groundbreaking work occurs in the wake of the massive migration of people from all over the world to New York City at the turn of the 20th century. So there were dozens of different ethnic and language groups among the city's children. Dovetailing with these librarians' conscientious work with immigrant children were milestones in African American librarianship. <coughs> we recall that the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture whose foundational collection was created by Puerto Rican bibliophile Arturo Alfonso Schomburg, was also established in the 1920s at the NYPL's 135th Street branch. This branch is in, of course, Harlem, which was evolving at the time uh, into the black cultural and intellectual mecca we associate with the Harlem Renaissance. To serve the surrounding community better, Ernestine Rose, who was the head librarian at that branch, integrated her staff, hiring important figures in African-American and Afro-Caribbean library history, including Catherine Allen Latimer, 
Nella Larson Imes, and Budabelle Frick. Mm -hmm. in, her essay, in her essay, Bilingual Storytelling, which was recently republished in the Recovery Project, um, Belle Pre explains how and why she eventually took up puppetry. This was during her time in the children's room at the Aguilar Branch in East Harlem, where she was transferred to serve the growing Puerto Rican community there in the 1940s. She writes, and I quote, Aguilar had a feeling for clubs. The Little Women's Club was an institution sanctioned by the girls' austere parents for, for them to attend. <laughs> I felt that the boys needed some creative activity, too. I suggested puppetry. The boys liked the idea, but refused to do hand puppets. This, they thought, was girl stuff. <laughs> they wanted marionettes. <laughs>
so um, the three wishes is sort of, I've, I've, I've read it in other uh, versions. It's the one where the, the man gets three wishes from some magical creature and then um, kind of wastes one on asking for sausages and then the wife yells at him so then he says, well, like the sausages should go on your nose, which then happens because he wishes for it. And then the last wish is, is um, making your back to normal again. So um, what's fascinating to me is that, as, as you're saying, like the moral is able to be communicated because this this the way that the, this particular production is written, it's obviously in Germany somewhere, and there's this kind of folkloric um, quality to it, and um, German music used for different song, songs and dancing. Um, but it's it's super interesting to think about that um, Thomas. Well, so, so there's this kind of really interesting dynamic happening where she's reclaiming. Um, marionettes, which we learned started in this physical traditions. So this is like European characters that are being portrayed by African Americans. Um, but on the other hand, um, it's, it's interesting to think that she didn't feel the need to transpose the uh, production into, say, African American characters. I see. Interesting. I find that, that when you're approaching a difficult topic, there's this sense of disbelief that people buy into the puppet. So it's, the puppet is often non-threatening, and because you're coming from that perspective, the puppet can get away with things that a human would not be able to do. <laughs> and then that happens across cultures. <laughs> um, there, are some cultures there are some cultures where a puppet can get away with saying something that a person might be in prison for saying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that happens. Yeah. Fascinating. I don't want to uh, control this, but please, please, because I have a million more questions. But is there, any, is there anything out there that um, okay, you want to question? Well, how would you compare puppetry in the 20th century to puppetry now in the 21st century? Hmm. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's put this into context, Bruce. Are we okay. talking about American puppetry, world puppetry? However, you want to take it from I think in America. Well, I think in America, and we've heard some of this from some of the other puppeteers, those of us who grew up in a period where we were exposed to puppetry from television, mm -hmm. we can see television and the impact that that has had. And certainly the Hansons have been yes. powerful about that. Um, it's, it's evident in how many puppeteers currently are using Muppet-like constructions. Mm -hmm. That is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. That has changed. You didn't see that like 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. that's, that's one thing. So construction, I think, is one thing. The exposure through television, through theater, um, has been has had a major impact on people just seeing different types of comments. Thanks. Other thoughts on that? I was going to say the internet ruined everything. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have time, but I can. <laughs>
that's not happening now. Y'all understand what I'm saying? So when I was young, art was a part of everything. And there was money for it, and we learned and stuff. Now that's not important at all. And there's this, this pushback. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like only rich people or people who are in education can do it. And that's not reaching the people that are in the community. <clears throat> Is there anything in place that schools or universities or institutions can do so that they can still be beneficial to the people on the streets? Well, in terms of, you know, my work in public ministry, a lot of times the churches fund for me to come into the church uh, to teach the children and to build puppetry programs, you know, at their particular institution. Uh, sometimes it comes from denominations, like the head office of maybe American Baptist churches, you know, an, another uh, stream of income. Or they have people that are set aside in the church that say, okay, we want our children, you know, to learn about puppetry. We want to learn, we want them to learn how to make puppets. We want to learn how to, to create stories that impact their community and to be able to express themselves. So that's how, you know, we personally, you know, are able to get funding. But it would be helpful if maybe <laughs> universities would um, provide grants for particular programs mm -hmm. to help support. Yeah. Let me just say when this is all said and done, that gentleman back there in the corner who is really quiet, he, he can tell you how what you just talked about is happening right now in this building, at this university institution, or this community all through the summer, that there's more programming that you can shake a stick at. So he, he can have a conversation with you. Now, if you're not in this community, I'm so sorry if you're just not here. <laughs> in this community, it could be a desert out there. I don't know. But we're, we're trying to give love here. And, Professor Bell can have a conversation with you about how that's happening, and maybe it can be replicated. Yeah. Historically, just to jump in real quick, um, I'm a Thomas. Um, I, I kind of am not sure how conscious it was, although I, I want to believe, like, because she becomes such a community organizer and activist, that it is very conscious on her part that she does productions at the actual school where the students are, but then takes those productions to the local YWCA to Howard University and to um, settlement houses and community centers in Washington. So she is really thinking about access and, um, I mean, she's basically taking it out to people who might not feel comfortable going to Howard, for example, but to see a performance. It's an issue for sure. Our last question. I've heard, um, this is nice into my question, which is, um, three of you are deep invested in D.C. and Baltimore. <laughs> So I was wondering about the influence of Howard or the school system, Shaw High School, which is a really prominent high school. I'm sorry, junior high. Um, and whether it is part of that, that history and institutional um, legibility in the communities that permits, or, or is it community-based grassroots, especially as a daughter of Baltimore? That wasn't for you in DC. Um, no. <laughs>